Okay, so welcome everyone to today's learning session. We'll be talking about uh, complex adaptive systems. My name is Joss Colchester. I'm uh, here in London with the SI uh, London team, and I'm going to be walking you through today's uh, learning session. And um, some of you will know me already. I uh, have been teaching complexity and systems thinking for about five, six years now, produced a lot of those video courses you'll find on our website and on YouTube. And I've produced a course on this topic also, Complex Adaptive Systems. Um, again, you can find that on the website. So today we've got one hour uh, and we've got a lot of stuff to cover. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump right in. And uh, this is the topic. I'll just let you know that today's event is being live streamed. So it'll be recorded to share with uh, people who aren't able to make it today. Um, I'll share with you also the link to this mirror board. Uh, we're going to be doing some uh, exercises today uh, to help you think about this stuff. Um, so you're welcome to jump uh, straight in here or at a later stage. Things locked down. Okay, so I'm just uh, collecting more people, but let's get started. So complex adaptive systems. This is of course in our series of um, presentations, learning sessions uh, on the SI systems innovation guides, right? You'll find them on our website. We've uh, covered about four so far. Um, we're in the section on systems thinking where we're learning to, to, to think in systems, uh, to become systems thinkers. Last time we covered complexity theory and this, this, this guide here is really building upon that, right? We're just kind of extending it into the world of adaptive systems as we'll talk about. And you'll find the guide here. Um, if you go to the website and, and uh, put systemsinnovation.io slash guides, you'll find them all there, or you can click here and uh, this will take you directly to that guide. And you can dig into that. Obviously, I'll only get to touch upon it today. Um, if you want to learn more, you can read that. And there's uh, additional resources and links there. So here's what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about adaptive systems to get started. We're then going to talk about uh, game theory, uh, the dynamics of cooperation and, and competition that emerge between adaptive agents. We're going to talk about evolution as a process that shapes uh, complex adaptive systems over the long term. I'm also going to touch upon, hopefully if we get time, a little bit about resilience and um, yeah, how, how um, robustness and resilience, how, how complex adaptive systems deal with change and adapt and respond to it. Um, hopefully we'll get there, but to get started, what is a complex adaptive system? Uh, as we talked about before, uh, it's, a, it's a complex system. So it's a, it's a system that has many parts and those parts are highly interconnected, interdependent. Um, they also, the parts have a degree of autonomy, right? Uh, the whole thing can't be centrally controlled. And that's a key kind of aspect to all of this. But when we talk about complex adaptive systems, we just extend that to say that these agents, these actors, these elements in the system have a degree of adaptive capacity, right? So they're not just inert uh, elements. So just to make a little distinction there, the weather, here in the UK or across Europe is a complex system. It has many interacting and interdependent parts, each of which are affecting the overall emergent state of the weather. You know, humidity, pressure, uh, wind, so on and so forth. Um, and it's interconnected across the whole planet, right? So that's a complex system, but actually those elements aren't adaptive, right? The, the, the clouds, um, the wind and so forth is not making its own decisions. And that's the distinction. The weather is a complex system, but this here, traffic, is a complex adaptive system. Why? Because each of these elements in that system, we can see many elements here, right? All these cars, um, and they're interconnected, and they're interdependent, and they have a degree of autonomy, but they also, the agents in those systems, we call them agents, I'll talk about those in a minute, have a degree of adaptive capacity. And we know that we get in our car, we make decisions. If we see a lot of traffic in front of us, we might go in a different direction, so on and so forth. So this is a complex adaptive system. And that's just one example there, uh, traffic. Uh, there are many others. And um, I guess going back to the question of why would we be interested in this in the context of systems change or systems innovation? 
And the answer to that is that everything we really want to change in, 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 in systems innovation and systems change is actually a complex adaptive system, right? So if you're interested in making changes in healthcare, in finance, in energy and food systems, in governance, in so on, education, so on and so forth, you're interested in changing complex adaptive systems and your capacity to shape, guide, influence uh, those change processes will radically increase if you actually understand the nature of the system you're dealing with as opposed to not properly understanding it. And that's why we would wanna study complex adaptive systems. That's why we would want to understand them because they have their own specific dynamics and ways of operating and organizing. If we understand those, then we have a, a chance to guide them and influence them. So here's another one. This is the kind of classic image you'll see when people talk about complex adaptive systems. Uh, this is a flock of starlings called uh, murmurations, the way they, they flock in this particular pattern. And uh, it's quite beautiful. It's quite uh, extraordinary. We know no one's uh, in control there. It's all these uh, agents in the system, the birds, each one making only local decisions about what to do. And out of those local rules that each bird follows, uh, we know they have certain rules around staying in the, flying in the same direction as, as the birds near to them. They're just looking at the birds close to them and deciding how far should I go? What direction should I go in? How far from my uh, neighbor should I fly? And out of all those local interactions, we get the emergence of this global pattern of organization. And that's how pattern emerges in complex systems. That's how order is formed in complex systems because no one's in control, right? There is no bird telling them all what to do. The order emerges out of the local interactions and the rules of the agents in the system. So it's very important, those rules that they're operating under. So scientists have modeled this and they know that you can simulate these patterns in these birds with just four simple rules, simple algorithm for each bird. You could write a computer program and simulate that. Each bird just had four simple rules. So that's one of the ideas that complexity can emerge out of very simple rules and the interaction between agents. You don't need a very complicated plan to create something like this. You can get it out of very simple rules and the interactions between them, which leads to the emergence of this global pattern of organization. And that's key to what we're, we're interested in, complexity theory, complexity science, um, because it's really what this is all about, it's how we get these patterns. It's how we get these patterns over here, traffic jams. It's how we get all patterns, we'll talk about it now, institutions within society, um, so on and so forth. So these are other examples of complex systems, all types of social organizations, businesses, um, governments, schools, universities, so on and so forth, families, partnerships, ecosystems, many different elements interacting. Um, and we know many of those have adaptive capacity, right? The trees, um, they're responding to light, uh, all the different creatures there, so on and so forth. This here, an interesting one, right? Uh, the urban infrastructure for India. It's a complex adaptive system. No one planned that whole thing out. It evolved over a very prolonged period of time out of local choices of people, right? People chose individually to move into those cities, to locate there, to gather there. No one came along with a master plan designing this whole thing, but over a very long period of time, it has emerged into this uh, overall pattern here. Yeah, cities, very good examples of complex systems. And even this down here, it's a complex system, just a few people trying to perform this collective function of moving this thing here, carry this. They're all relatively autonomous, but they're interdependent in this overall function. Each one has adaptive capacity and each one is affecting each other. Slight moves by each person is affecting everyone else in that system. It's adapting and changing over time. That's a relatively simple one compared to you know, a city or something like this. So for those who are able to make it onto the mirror board, I'd love for you to join me here and grab a sticky and post up any, any other examples that you might have. Let me just read this here to see what we're talking about. Complex adaptive systems are all around us from financial markets to ecosystems to the human immune system and even civilization itself. 
These systems consist of many agents that are acting and reacting to each other's behavior. Out of this often chaotic set of interactions emerges global patterns of organization in a dynamic world of constant change and evolution where nothing's fixed. So you can see that here, nothing's really fixed in this traffic, right? The traffic's constantly changing, it's constantly flowing and, and pat new patterns are constantly creating themselves, right? When the traffic lights change, traffic flows forwards and then it backs up and then sometimes it gets really built up at peak hours and other times. It's a very dynamic system we're dealing with here, constantly changing. So yeah, I'll share the link again. And if you could join me down here where you find these images and grab a sticky. So how do you, how do, you do it? You just double click on, on an empty section of the board there. And then you type in any ideas you might have here about a complex adaptive system. Do you have any ideas? Please share them with us. Let's just take uh, Josh, one minute to do them. Yep. Josh, not, yep. seeing, not seeing the link in the chat. Okay, come again and I'll show it to you here. There we go. Mm -hmm. No. No. Sorry, I'm sure I must be sharing it in the meeting room. Here we go. There we go. There it is. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So you should find uh, the board where I am here. And if you go down to the bottom of it, you'll see the images. Um, you can click on the sticky icon on the left there and put it down, or you can just double click on the board and type away. Any ideas? You can also unmute yourself if you have an idea and you want to shout it out. So families, yeah, families are very good examples. And they're constantly changing again too, aren't they? Like um, if you went for a seven hour drive on holiday with your family, there'll be ups and there'll be downs. And there's this, uh, take a conversation is, is a good example of kind of a, a complex adaptive system just between three people, right? Um, and it can evolve and develop in many different directions because everybody's adapting to what everyone else says. Any other examples? Uh, families. Uh, okay, over here, software. Is that software? Yeah. Okay, some kinds of software. I mean, maybe artificial intelligence could be a neural networks could be examples of complex adaptive systems. Um, but yeah, I think large information systems. Um, airline routes. Yeah, good example. Um, any system that has two or more humans interacting. Yeah, exactly, a family. Um, but it doesn't have to be humans, right? It's, you know, this ecosystem here could be robots, like that example of software. You know, these could be two algorithms um, in a financial market interacting with each other, or three or four different algorithms. Um, could be ecosystems, could be humans, could be... Um, yeah, other forms of technology uh, that have adaptive capacity, uh, autonomous vehicles, social media, social networks for sure. Um, all transport systems, yeah. Okay, armed forces. Yeah, I think a really interesting one is between um, law enforcement and criminal networks. Criminal networks are very good examples of complex adaptive systems because they don't have the kind of formal structures. They can't uh, 
by necessity have the kind of formal structures that most organizations have. They develop in a much more organic kind of networked fashion. And, um, and then you put them in interaction with the um, law enforcement, right? And the two are then constantly adapting. They're trying to, you know, the law enforcement is trying to capture the, um, capture information, capture people in the, uh, in the criminal network and the criminal network's trying to adapt and evolve and, and not get caught. Same for cybersecurity. Um, there's constant adaptation and interaction between the two systems. So river network in the rainforest, um, multi, what's this, uh, mycelium and uh, fungi roots, yep. Napster exchanging files on the internet, yep. Great, so migrating herds of animals, healthcare, very good, uh, immune response to the human body. Okay, human body, great. So let's stay going, those are, those are good examples. Hopefully you have a general sense of what we're talking about here when we talk about complex adaptive systems. And now let's kind of jump into looking a bit about how these things work um, and what's involved here. And the first thing, um, as we've said, is this idea of adaptation, right? And these agents in the system, obviously very critical, whole things kind of emerging out of these agents and their, their um, interactions. So all adaptive systems, these like human beings, um, regulate some process and they do this in order to maintain and develop their structure and function. So the first question we wanna ask is why, what are these agents in the system doing, right? It's obviously critical, like those birds, are they still here? Has someone taken the image somewhere? Um, it's gone, okay. Those birds, why are they doing, what, are, what rules are they operating under? What rules are these people here operating under and these here and these creatures in the ecosystem? So you call these agents and obviously they have some kind of logic to what they're doing. It's not random. And we need to know a little bit about that. And the idea is that what they're doing is regulating themselves, trying to regulate themselves and their environment because they're trying to maintain and develop their structure and function. For example, plants process light other nutrients and their adaptive capacity enables them to alter their state so as to intercept more of those resources. So when the plant moves from left to right, it's doing that for a reason to get more light because that's what's gonna help it develop its structure and functioning. So it's making choices for a particular reason. The same is true for bacteria and animals. The same is true for a basketball team or a business, right? They're doing something um, strategically. And that helps us understand what they're doing and then um, why they're operating the way they are. And this creates, they have a certain value system, right? That's the idea, these agents have a value system. Uh, whether it's the resources they require, whether it's sunlight, fuel, food, money, whatever it may be. And they're, they're trying to improve their state with respect to whatever it is they're val val valuing. These guys up here, they value money and they're trying to, they're taking actions, they're agents within a market system, the market, financial market is a complex adaptive system. And it's composed of these agents and they're trading with each other and the way the choices that they make and the interactions between them determine that market, they determine the prices in that market. And of course, they're not making those choices randomly. Uh, they have some money and they want to try and increase that value that they have, right? And they're making choices strategically to try and increase the value that they have. So that's, that's what I'm getting at here. Uh, same for this guy here. He's another adaptive agent. He's now in a complex adaptive system we call an ecosystem. And he's making choices strategically because he doesn't want to run out of energy. He doesn't want to starve and die. He wants to get the food and nutrients and so forth find a, a, an environment that is conducive for that. And that's why these agents are, that's the, the rules, the general framework under which they're making choices. And the process through which they do that, we call reg, a regula, regulatory uh, process. And this gets us to this idea of cybernetics. Maybe you've heard of cybernetics, I'm not sure. It's an area of systems thinking. 
or systems theory that spans all the way back into the 20th century. And it's about understanding processes of control and regulation within adaptive systems that can, all, all kinds of adaptive systems. And it's really studying this process of how these systems regulate and control themselves and ultimately try to maintain homeostasis. So this here is a control system or a regulatory system. There's a controller at the center there. It's able to take actions to affect the system it forms part of, and then it has a sensor to feed back that information. So it takes an action. Um, these guys take an action, they make a trade, then they, they take, a, take a look, they get information back. They, they decide to take a tra uh, make a trade, that's the controller. They make that trade, they actually click a button on their screen to trade the money. Then they see what happened in the market. Did, it, did they achieve what they wanted to? They have the sensor, they get information back, and then they make decisions again, and they iterate through that. Um, so that's a feedback loop. And cybernetics is the study of those. So cybernetics is the study of control, communications and information processes within systems of all kinds, biological, mechanical, and social. The primary objective for the study within cybernetics are control systems that are regulated by negative feedback loops. So this is how complex adaptive systems regulate and control themselves through these feedback loops. Sometimes they're centralized. So a feedback loop is, is when you take an action. A feedback loop is when you take an action and that action feeds back to affect you again. And that is a way of regulating or controlling something, right? So when you drive down the road, you're regulating and controlling the car. And you're doing that for a particular function, you're trying to get somewhere. And you use a negative feedback loop to do that, right? When you, you sense the direction the car's going in, if it's going too far to one side as opposed to another, then you take an action to drive it back into the center of the road. And that's a balancing feedback loop. You're continuously trying to balance the car to bring it back into the center of the road so that you can get to where you want to go. And that's how complex adaptive systems regulate themselves. Sometimes it's centralized. Uh, could we all mute ourselves, please? Sometimes it's centralized, right? With you driving down the road or this here, the thermostat and um, the air conditioning or heating in your house, this is a centralized control system because there is a unit in your house that is uh, controlling the temperature of your house. That's a relatively simple one. The same is true of you driving down the road in your car. It's a centralized control system. You, you your, your brain is, is regulating that system. But there can also be decentralized one. This ecosystem here is actually regulated in a decentralized fashion. No one's in control of this whole ecosystem, really. Some, some factors are more important than others, right? The climate is very important. Um, so the, there's very important factors here, but ultimately not, none of them are determining the whole system. There's a lot of feedback loops here, right? We know one of them is around predator and prey, and that's a bouncy feedback, feedback loop. We know that you know, if you have more pr prey, then you can have more predators. But if there's more predators, they're gonna eat more prey, which will bring the prey down again, which will bring the predators down again. So that's a balancing feedback loop. And there's many of those in ecosystems. And it's actually a decentralized way of regulating that whole system. So an ecosystem, a mature ecosystem like this represents um, quite a stable in some way, complex adaptive system. It takes a very long time to get a mature ecosystem like that. And there are many distributed feedback systems that prevent it from going out of whack or going off, off out of its normal kind of equilibrium state. I mean, it's changing all the time, of course, but um, it stays within a certain bounded state because there's a lot of negative feedback. So that's the idea of uh, agents, adaptive agents and uh, regulation. Um, we can see here, here's another agent making a choice about these apples. She's looking for the best apple and uh, She's taking actions and making decisions. Here, we know governments are kind of centralized control systems. Um, they're trying to maintain an equilibrium uh, within their societies. And they take actions, they, they process information, they get data about the population, they have analysts, and then they take actions, regulation, incentives, whatever it may be. 
And uh, those are all examples of uh, those decentralized uh, regulatory systems through those feedback uh, processes. So that's uh, the adaptive agents. But then the question is, what happens when those agents interact? Because that's you know, where all the magic's happening here. It's not just a bunch of individual people. It's actually that they're interacting with each other. And a lot of what happens is determined by the dynamics of cooperation and competition between these actors. And this is studied, if you've heard of, maybe heard of this game theory, which studies exactly that. It looks at situations of cooperation and competition between adaptive agents. And sometimes those games, we call them. So here's a game over here. These are adaptive agents, they're interacting and it's creating a dynamic, right? Tennis games, a very dynamic system. And we know actually some of those agents, there's four agents there, and some of them are in a situation of competition and others are in a situation of cooperation. Um, so we know like what's happening here is actually driven a lot by the agents, of course, but by the dynamics that they're, they're in, the, the, the game they're engaged in. The game is set up in such a way that some agents are cooperating. These two here are cooperating. They're on the same team. They work together, but they're competing with those agents over there. So that's a very uh, important uh, factor here. These games can be found uh, throughout society in all, all these situations of interaction between adaptive agents in, engender some structure. That's an underlying structure that really shapes how the game is working. So these two here, these people on this side against those, they're in a non-cooperative game, which is a game of competition. That means it's a zero sum game. Only one side here is gonna win. So if these guys do better, those guys are gonna do worse. If those guys do better, these guys are gonna do worse. And that's the way it is, right? One person is gonna win the next round in that and one person is gonna win this game or one side is gonna win this game. And that's all there is to it. So there's no incentive for cooperation. We call that a competitive game or a um, non-cooperative non game, should we say. There's no reason for them to cooperate. So I'll talk now in a minute about other types of games, but maybe you could post up there another example of a competitive game. Could be in business, could be in society, could be any way you can think of. I want you to grab a sticky and post up another example of a competitive game. Here's another one, right? War. There's not co they're not cooperating, they're competing. So let's take a minute to do that, to have a think about non-cooperative games.
Okay, Dora has done work promotions. Work promotions, okay, let's put that up there. No, not that one. Work promotions. Okay, anybody else want to unmute themselves and say something that they have here? Divorce, zero sum game. Yeah. Any race? Yep. Chess, chess is a zero sum game. One person is going to win, one's going to lose. Boxing, competing hospitals or competing businesses. Uh, grass species succession in the ecosystem, early stage. Okay, some. Some creatures are going to win and others are going to lose. Uh, marketing, mm, interesting one. Marketing could be zero sum, could, could not, might not necessarily. Um, depends kind of what, what aspect we're talking about there. Uh, patents, college admission, college admission. Yeah, I guess maybe there's a finite amount of places in this college. And if you get in, then uh, that's going to limit the chances of someone else getting in. Court cases, plaintiff versus defendant. Getting, uh, getting produce, goods, TP during COVID lockdown from a grocery store. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's only so much food in the store. Uh, food is a... a um, finite resource, right? And if someone gets it and someone else doesn't, generation, generation of seeds and growth of saplings. Bidding for work, potentially, yeah. Democratic elections, potentially. Okay, that was one I had here actually, right? Uh, where was it? Down here. So it could be these politicians here, if we're saying the United States and there's just two, you know, primary uh, candidates for the presidency. Well, that's a pretty much a zero sum game, right? One person who wins, the other is going to lose. So non cooperative games, this is one where an element of competition uh, exists. There are limited mechanisms for uh, creating institutions for corporations, cooperation. Uh, Non-cooperation may be a function of isolation, lack of communication and interaction uh, with which to build up the trust needed to cooperate. So uh, let me get into that in a minute, but I think this is a good example, right? What's, you know, if these are in a zero sum game, one's gonna win, the other's gonna lose, that innately creates conflict, it creates tension, it creates uh, competition. And it creates a whole set of dynamics that emerge out of that, imagine, if we were asking our presidents to demonstrate collaboration, what's their capacity to collaborate? And they would win based upon that. Or both of them could win if they could both collaborate well, as opposed to only one will win and you have to compete with the other. When we say that only one will win, we are creating a game, we're creating a structure uh, that's incentivizing towards competition. And we know the kind of dynamics we get out of it. Um, these people, a lot of destructive dynamics, right? These people, this person here spends a lot of time digging up scandal on this person. But if we could, we could construct a totally different game there. We could construct a game that said, um, there'll be as many people in this office as can collaborate successfully and work together successfully. Um, and then these people would have to demonstrate their capacity to work together. And that would incentivize the agents in the system towards very different behavior. So it's saying not all games are cooperative and not all games are written in stone, right? We could design these games very differently, right? Monopoly is a type of game where there are winners and there are losers, but you can design other types of games where people have to collaborate and work together and so forth. And those incentivize in very different ways. The agents in the system will respond to those incentives and they will operate in very different ways. And the outcomes you'll get from that will result in very uh, you get very different outcomes. So if you look at this here, highly cooperative game, 
this lady and her child, she's going to sacrifice and give this child a lot of her time, energy, resources over the next 20 or so years. Um, and she is intimately interconnected and interdependent. Their, their fate is intimately interconnected and interdependent and they're engaged in a very cooperative game. Even though there'll be aspects of competition sometimes, there'll be little bits of conflict. Um, ultimately, it's a game of cooperation where they'll massively share resources. So it's a slightly different, it's a cooperative game. We get very different dynamics there. And this is what's really shaping uh, the kind of outcomes that we see um, in complex adaptive systems, supply chains, right? Sometimes the agents are competing across different supply chains. Sometimes in that supply chain, they're collaborating and so forth. So those are examples of games. Here we have businesses, someone talked about that. Um, a lot of game theory comes from studying international politics and should uh, a government, you know, what should a, it goes back to the Cold War when the United States were thinking about, well, if the Soviet Union does this, if they put those rockets, uh, if they put those nuclear weapon, weapons near to us in Cuba, what should we do in that, that situation? So they're studying those dynamics of competition between those two states. Here we have businesses. Um, sometimes they collaborate, right? Sometimes they compete, so on and so forth. And we can see here is the emergence of patterns. This is a complex adaptive system. And we can see this is a group here in some sense, and they're working together in some way. And that's getting the emergence of a certain pattern. And over here, we have another group and they're collaborating in another way. And potentially there's a, a competition dynamic between them. So what I hope you see from this is how we've talked about agents and now we're talking about interaction, how these interactions between them competition, cooperation, lead to patterns in the system, uh, institutions, for example, and the emergence of the overall uh, structures that we see. So that's that. There's also, yeah, as mentioned, there's cooperative games, right? Um, a cooperative game is one in which uh, there can be cooperation between the players and they have the same cost. Right, so all are winning or losing together is kind of the idea. In a non-cooperative game, people, some people are winning and other people are losing. In this game, they're in it together, right? If the child suffers a lot, the parent is gonna suffer a lot. If the child is successful and does well, the parent is gonna experience that also. So they're in a game that incentivizes towards cooperation. Their costs are intimately connected to each other. Cooperative games are an example of non-serious harm games. This is because in cooperative games, either every player wins or loses. Cooperation may be achieved through a number of different possibilities. It may be built into the dynamics of the game, as would be the case with positive sum games, where payoffs are positively correlated. So everybody's going to win together or everyone's going to lose uh, together. In such a case, the uh, innate structure of the game incentivizes the game, creates an attractor towards cooperation because it's both in the in interest of the individuals and the whole organization. So a good example, trade is an example, two countries trading, a good example of this are the mutually beneficial gains from trade in goods and services between nations. If businesses or countries can find terms of agreement in which both parties benefit, then specialization in trade can lead to an overall improvement in economic welfare of both countries, with both sides seeing it as in their interest to cooperate in this organization because of the extra value that is being generated. So that's an example of a cooperative game, a positive sum game, right? When two countries or two businesses uh, decide to trade and each one specializes in what it does best, the whole uh, more value can be created uh, for the whole. So kind of the question here, you know, question that pops out from this and be very interested, very important as we go through in systems innovation later on is the question of, well, these, ne these, these zero sum gains aren't very good for us, really, they don't help us. We get wars, we get competition and so forth. So how do we potentially turn zero sum and games of competition into uh, cooperative games where people are actually collaborating and so forth. This is a big part of systems change. How do we get a group of agents to work together 
constructively to collaborate towards changing the system and achieving better outcomes for everyone. Uh, and it's a big part of kind of what we do in society, try to construct institutions that enable us to work together. Um, and uh, that's about achieving collaboration or cooperation in almost every situation of interaction between human beings, social or economic, there's an optimal equilibrium where everyone cooperates and all get a good payoff. But there's also often a non-cooperative option that is not so good for all involved. But a better option if agents are only self-interested and there's no way to enable cooperation between them. So there's two equilibriums in a system, one which is non-cooperative, um, it's a stable equilibrium. Everyone acts kind of selfishly and takes their part. Or there's another one where you're able to create an institution for, for collaboration and um, everybody reaps the benefits of cooperation. In many ways, we can say it's the job of social and economic institutions to try and provide this infrastructure that enables trust between us so that everyone chooses the cooperative outcome and all get the best trip to pay off. Right? And this is why we have a lot of our institutions um, you know, governments and the law and uh, law enforcement make it so that I don't steal from my neighbor and my neighbor doesn't steal from me. It's better for both of us if we don't steal from each other. But it might be without, without an institution to enable the trust between me and my neighbor, it might be difficult to get into that equilibrium where we, we don't steal from each other. And we may end up in an equilibrium where he steals something from me, so then I decide I need to steal something from him and so on. Okay, so, so that's that, the dynamics of cooperation and competition uh, between agents within these systems and the kind of patterns that emerge um, out of those. And we'll talk now about uh, evolution, which is really a key, key part of this. It's really how, you know, this question about if we have these decentralized systems, right? It's an ecosystem here. And we, we talked about how it's a decentralized system. Again, no one's in control, right? No one's telling all these creatures what to do or the whole system what to do. But somehow it's got to change over time. It's gonna to have to adapt. There are gonna be changes in the environment that require the whole ecosystem to adapt and evolve like, like climate change. And we know we've heard of this idea of evolution, right? And we know that's how an ecosystem changes over time. And the idea is that it's not just ecosystems. It's actually all complex adaptive systems. They manage to change themselves without having a boss, without having a CEO or someone telling everyone what to do. The whole system, the whole economy, the whole of an industry, the whole of a society or culture manages to change and respond and adapt to the changes within its environment through a process called evolution. So this is how complex adaptive systems change, adapt over time on the macro level. And we know that happens. Cultures change and adapt over time. They have to change. When we introduce new technologies or something like this into society, social media or something, our cultures have to adapt and respond to that. Our economies, new technologies get introduced and they have to evolve and adapt to uh, reap the benefits of those technologies and, and so on. So that's uh, evolutionary process. Let's take a look at what it's, what it, how it actually works, right? So it starts with some change. So this is all about changes in the environment and the system has to adapt to those. Um, the system creates variety. So lots of little species we know in ecosystems, uh, we get this cross mixing and uh, we get new variants, we get lots of different variants. And then there's a process of selection. So the different variants in the system are exposed to their operating environment to see which ones are best adapted and most successful within that context. So um, the climate's just changed here, right? There's an ecosystem, the climate's just changed. That means the existing ecosystem or species uh, insects we say here are not so well suited anymore. And there's a big production of variety in that through cross-mixing. And then there's gonna be selection. Some of those are gonna be better suited to that environment. They're gonna function better. 
And if they function better, they're going to get more food and resources, and then they'll be able to better be able to reproduce and they'll create more of themselves, they'll replicate themselves, and others won't. And then that population, that type of agent, will become more pop prominent in the system and over time uh, replace the other ones. And in such a way, the whole system has evolved, it's adapted, it's responded to the change in its environment, and it's now in a state that's better adapted to the environment. So you probably know about that from uh, ecology and so forth. Biology, obviously Darwin uh, introduced that idea a long time ago. Um, but we abstract it here in, to say that this is relevant for all complex adaptive systems. Let's take an example here in economics. This lady here is uh, performing selection, actually. What's happening here is there's many organizations, many businesses out there, um, and there's a market and they want a, a slice of the pie of that market. Um, they want to be successful. They need money to survive and so forth. So they generate products. They don't know which one's going to work, but they have a, have, a, have a hypothesis about what might work. And they produce a lot of variety, right? You go out and you look at how many shoes there are out there, many, many. And these then that's the production of variety, right? These companies trying new things to see if it'll work. The consumer comes along and performs selection on those products. She's saying, this is the one that suits me. This is the one that best works for me in this context. She chooses it, she gives the money, that money goes back to the company in some way. And if they produce the one that's best suited to that market environment, that consumer, that, that set of consumers at that time, they'll receive more resources, they'll become more prominent, and ultimately uh, they will take over when others uh, won't. And in such a way, when the market, when consumer needs change, the market, the whole thing will adapt, evolve, and learn to work, learn to respond to those changes. And in such a way, the whole thing is, has evolved without centralized coordination. This is a market system. No one tells them. It's not a communist system where the government plans the whole thing. Here, the market has figured out what's the best thing to do. It's adapted and evolved. Uh, same in uh, politics, right? So there's big changes in society and economy um, and culture. There'll be new political uh, politicians in a democracy I'm talking about, and um, we will come along and we'll select the one that we want, and um, we will select the one that best fits with our current social and economic conditions and, and cultural conditions, uh, our thinking and so forth, um, and in such a way we'll choose the ones which are best suited to that environment, and they will become more prominent, and other people will see that, and they'll become uh, more, they'll, they'll try and replicate or, or imitate those ones uh, because they see they're the ones that are working. So that's evolution generalized. And it's how complex adaptive systems evolve over time. It's how our infrastructures, how our technologies, how our economies and so forth, how our societies and our cultures and so forth change on the macro level. Joss, um, mm -hmm. might it be possible to interject um, uh, a question? Um, yep. Because of some of the work that I'm, I'm doing, um, and particularly with respect to David Sloan Wilson's work as an evolutionary biologist, um, and his um, citing a reference to uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin with respect to it within, my question is, it's posted there, um, is there a distinction within the complex adaptive systems theory between Im involution and evolution? Hmm. Do you wanna explain involution? Involution is the adaptation within the organism, is that correct? I've seen it represented, I mean, quite frankly, within, within integral, kind of within integral thought. Um, 
along the line of Otto Schammer's uh, U, U theory that in the U theory, the downward um, from downloading to co-sensing is an involutionary process and evolution doesn't is the up, upswing um, kind of in, involving the a transformation occurring from addressing identity and purpose um, and how that would translate with respect to causality. Uh, I, if that makes sense. I mean, that's that's just a real rough way of yeah. my my envisioning it. Kind of, I, I'm going back to to uh, Tillyard and actually looking because because involution there that was definitely a distinction uh, for mm. him in his work. You know, it's just a, okay. Uh, so so thank, thanks, Brian. I think that's a broader kind of conversation. Maybe you want to, for the sake of time, we've just got 10 minutes or so left. Maybe you want to post it on the website, the systemsinnovation.network, and we could have a chat about that um, afterwards. Okay, so um, yeah, just a bit of time left. Um, so yeah, this is critical for, for that reason of that question of when no one's in control, how does the whole complex adaptive system evolve? And this can be over a very long, we're kind of taught that evolution takes place over a long period of time, right? That's certainly the case in ecosystems, but it can actually be in very short periods of time. Um, if you speed that process up, right? We're now learning to actually design using this evolutionary algorithms, uh, what we're doing with neural networks and so forth. Um, is actually using this process here, but putting it into computer code. And obviously computers can iterate very quickly. Um, so you can have, you can create it, get a computer. They now have computers that might create uh, the designs for the um, shell of a car, right? The, the outing of a car um, and then run a simulation to see, well, what's the drag on that? What's the resistance on that? Uh, run a simulation against it. And then you can see, oh, that has a lot of resistance to it. And then the computer could then generate another one and run the program again to see how much drag is the, is it getting closer and keep on doing that and then try try many things in the way that these creatures here are trying many things put it into its environment see what the drag on it is see which ones work best and keep on iterating on that to try and find the optimal one and that's a lot of what evolutionary algorithms do now so i'm making the point that if you understand this you can start harnessing it um, and it doesn't have to be this long-term process um, it can be much faster uh, uh, and, and iterated upon if you uh, design it in that way. Um, okay, so finally, I want to talk a bit about um, adapt, uh, 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 resilience um, and robustness. So this is a kind of characteristic of, of complex systems or uh, yeah, complex systems in that they're decentralized in some uh, sense. So resilience. Resilience is typically understood as the capacity of a system to maintain functionality given some alteration. When a system is subject to some sort of perturbation or disturbance in its environment, it responds by moving away from its initial, um, initial state. So going back to this idea that these, these adaptive systems are trying to regulate themselves to maintain structure and functionality, this idea of homeostasis, right? For us to function optimally, and to maintain our, our, our functionality, we need a, a conducive environment, um, and that's called uh, a homeostatic environment. And here, we're the system is experiencing uh, a shock of some kind. It might be a tree that's that's been hit by a tornado or whatever it is. And its resilience is its capacity to move back into that kind of equilibrium functioning state. So the tendency of a system to remain close to its equilibrium state despite disturbance is termed robustness. If it's a very strong tree, it might be able to resist all that wind force against it and it stays in its equilibrium state and it's fine. On the other hand, the speed with which it adapts and finds a new viable state after disturbance may be understood as resilience. So it may be a very kind of flexible tree uh, that's able to adapt to these changes and uh, still maintain uh, its functionality. And we call this resilience. And it's this uh, decentralized nature to complex systems, complex adaptive systems that makes them uh, highly resilient. 
right? A centralized system, I think I have a little network here. A centralized system like this is very vulnerable to um, attack uh, and it can be quite fragile in terms of it's dependent on some centralized node. Whereas these complex adaptive systems, I mean, let's take a look at that flock of birds again. I mean, that certainly looks very resilient. Where, where was it? Over here. Look at this. If we damage one part of that, we know what's going to happen. It's going to adapt. It's going to respond. It doesn't need one part of itself, right? It's not like a government that has a president and the whole thing's kind of dependent upon them and they get assassinated or whatever and things start falling to pieces. It's not like some bit of technology where you just alter some part and a lot, a lot of it's dependent upon that. This thing here is decentralized and that would make it incredibly resilient. Another example would be the internet, right? It's a decentralized, the internet is a complex adaptive system. Uh, the underlying technology is a complex system, let's say. The underlying technology, no one's really in control of the whole thing. And it makes it highly resilient, right? We have data centers, we have routers, we have uh, servers all over the planet, and some of those can go down and the internet will survive um, because of its decentralized nature, it makes it highly uh, resilient, just like this. And for that capacity, you can imagine this thing almost kind of repairing itself, you know? If, if a hawk came in on one side, this may be a hawk up here, if it came swooping in on one side, all the birds would scatter, but then they'd reform again. And that's uh, an aspect, and we know that about ecosystems too, like they may suffer disasters, but then they would adapt, they'd regrow and reform over time. It's that decentralized nature that makes them extremely uh, resilient uh, to changes. There's this idea of anti-fragility. Maybe you've heard of it. You know, it's a book written uh, by Nicholas Taleb uh, recently. It refers to the property of systems that increase in capability to thrive as a result of disturbance, mistakes, shocks, or failures. So it's not something we're used to, right? Most of our the systems we engineer, they're not like that. If they have a shock, then they fracture and they don't actually heal themselves, right? If that building took a shock, it wouldn't heal itself. It would crack and it, over time it would degrade and probably fall to bits. So we're talking about something different. These kind of living systems that we're talking about here have a different capacity to like that ecosystem, like that flock of birds to, to regenerate themselves and rebuild themselves. And from those shocks, those disturbances, as he, Nabi Taleb is talking about here, anti-fragility, he's saying actually with these shocks, they get stronger. And that's the case, someone up here posted the human immune system, I believe, the human body, immune response in the human body is a com well-known complex adaptive system. And it's a system that is anti-fragile because when a child is brought into the world, their immune system is very weak and they require those shocks from their environments to build up their immune system. So it's such an anti-fragile system in some sense. It gets stronger when the child experiences whatever it is, it, the, the immune system, whatever antibody, whatever is attacking it, it may get sick, but then the immune system learns from that and it builds up a resistance. Next time, it's going to be able to deal with that better. So it's actually anti-fragile, the immune system in the human body. Very interesting property because, you know, our cities, the way we build things around here, they aren't like that at all. So very, very, very interesting, um, particularly in the context of kind of times we live in, or climate change and crisis and so forth. So this uh, resilience is about allowing the changes whilst looking at the system's ability to endure despite those changes, whereas resistance and robustness whereas re resist, resistance and robustness are about achieving success with resilience, failure becomes more valuable than success as it's only through failure that we build up resilience. Resilience is something that is learned through failure, right? It's through the child experiencing those attacks on its immune system, through the child getting sick, unfortunately, that it builds up that response. And there's kind of no other way, right? To build up your immune system, you're gonna to have to experience. 
Resistance is always about being aware and ready to adapt to unexpected resist, uh, risks. The resilience approach is about turning a crisis into an opportunity by seeing it as the potential to develop new capacities. For a resilient community, a community is another example of a complex adaptive system. For a resilient community, a change is a learning opportunity. For a fragile community, change is a crisis to be avoided. This is the concept of anti-fragility we just talked about. So that's uh, resilience and robustness. We've hit uh, the, end, the end of our hour at this time. So I just wanted to summarize. I hope you um, appreciate why this is important in the context. We are talking about system change, systems innovation. That's the overall series we're working on here. I um, hope you appreciate why this is important in that context. As we've talked about here, all the things we're, you know, the things we're interested in changing in, in systems change, they are cities, they are organizations, they are supply chains, they are transport systems, they're healthcare systems, they're all the things we've talked about. And you can see here, you probably weren't taught these things in school, right? So you probably didn't know these things coming into here. If you understand these things, the whole idea here is that if you don't understand these things, then you're going to do what a lot of other people do. They try and impose order on the system because they don't understand it, right? The Minister of Health comes in and says, we're going to do this, guys. Here's our five-year plan or whatever, and pushes it out down through the hierarchy. If you understand this, if you understand that what you're doing with, dealing with the healthcare system is a complex adaptive system, and these things are alive and they have agents in them, and those agents are making choices and they're interacting, and out of those interactions emerges patterns and there's evolution happening here, so if you understand those things, then you can say, right, how can I work with them? How can I work with those dynamics? Instead of trying to impose order on it, I can enable the system to grow. As you may have noted here, there's a lot of analogies to living systems. That's the nature of these complex adaptive systems. They're alive, really. If you look at all these things here, they're alive. Businesses, societies, ecosystems, so on and so forth. And how do we work with that? instead of trying to impose order on the system. And that's kind of what we're trying to do with the systems change approach, enable these complex adaptive systems to self-organize and organize in a functional way. And if we understand all this stuff, then we're in a much better situation to be able to do that. Okay, guys, uh, we're gonna wrap up there. Um, if you have any questions, as, as mentioned, anything you wanna talk about, let's post it in the community website, systems innovation, dot network and i'm happy to reply to anything there okay thank you very much let's wrap up for now and i hope to see you again next month we'll be talking about uh, systems modeling and, and systems inquiry systems mapping